Many common dog behaviour problems include excessive barking, digging and destructive chewing. And these are often occurring when dogs are left alone in the backyard all day with nothing to do. Dogs are pack animals and in the wild they would spend their days hunting and foraging for their food, keeping their brains and their bodies active. So it's not surprising we see so many bored or anxious dogs acting out in this way. In my book, Eat, Play, Love Your Dog, I talk about this a lot and I share my tips for beating the backyard blues. So let's delve into what some of these are and how you can use treats and games to make your dog's life and yours as a result much happier. Firstly, all dog owners have a responsibility to ensure their dog is receiving daily exercise appropriate to its breed, age and temperament. For the large majority of adult dogs, this means at least 30 minutes of walking every day, while active breeds require much more. Short daily bursts of obedience training is also a great way to not only work their brains and expel some energy, it also helps to promote desired behaviours rather than unwanted ones and provides your dog with the leadership they need to help reduce stress and confusion in an uncertain world. A dog's sense of smell is its most important sense and our dogs absorb the world around them through their nose. So when tapping into this, when they spend time alone, it can be of really great benefit. If you feed your dog dry dog food, ditch the bowl and instead hide it around the house or the backyard. Use treats to up the ante with a game of treat treasure hunt. You can also leave them with a couple of treat dispensing interactive toys like these. I like to cut up a chicken or milky stick into small pieces and then that way I'm making sure I'm not feeding my boys more than 10% of their required total daily calorie intake with treats. If your dog is digging, do just make sure they have enough shade or cover to protect them from the sun or rain. But if it's due to boredom or anxiety, or they just love to dig, then you can use a sand pit to divert the digging to a designated area and bury some treats or toys in them to encourage them to dig in just that one spot. If they have gotten into the habit of digging up your garden bed though, or under the fence, then block those areas off to help prevent that behaviour. Long lasting chews or occupiers are another weapon in the armoury to help keep them busy. And if you can't avoid leaving them at home all day or struggle to meet their daily exercise needs then of course a dog walker is definitely something to consider. With all of this combined your dog should be feeling fulfilled rather than frustrated and spend their afternoon getting some well-earned rest which is another important part of looking after their health and keeping problem behaviour at bay. Head to the Pooches at Play website and search Brain Games to see the Vita Pet Treat Treasure Hunt in action. And for more tips and tricks or information about the Vita Pet Treat range, head to theirs. Hey, you did very well, boys. Very good. This week's breeding focus is known as the clown of the dog world for their expressive faces and cheeky personalities, the pug. And today we are joined here by Bumblebee. We've got Peppy there for a minute, I think, and Panda as well. Originating in the Far East as early as the first century BC, a very long time ago, they were bred as companions for ruling families in China, highly valued by Chinese emperors, and they were even guarded by soldiers. Oh, that's pretty special. <laughs> Anyone who has met or owned a pug will know that they are lively, but they're also affectionate little dogs that love people of all ages and generally all other dogs, although they can be somewhat stubborn at times. They pretty much suit any family from those with children or the elderly and any sized home or apartment, as long as they get plenty of attention and lots of cuddles. What are you doing? And treats. They are definitely happy little bundles of joy and are very intelligent, but being quite willful, it can mean training is a challenge at times, so get onto it early, work on toilet training and setting those boundaries. They are more than happy to just sit around on your lap or dig away on the blanket, but they still have lots of energy to burn, so we'll need daily walks and lots of playtime. However, because of their flat faces, they should not be overexerted or taken out in the heat. Are you listening there, Panda? <laughs> Yes, keeping them active is super important because given their love of food and their small and stocky stature, many pugs are prone to becoming overweight, which negatively impacts on their health. Unfortunately, the pug's appearance has changed radically over the centuries. Their body and nose were actually much longer once upon a time, but as humans manipulated their looks, they now have the flat face of a typical brachycephalic breed, which results in breathing issues known as brachycephalic airway syndrome. It's best rectified with surgery early in life. 
Mm, yes, and exactly, if they overexert themselves, this is what happens. As they were bred for companionship, the pug is definitely an indoor dog. It's not a good breed at all for being left alone for long periods of time. For the house proud, seriously, be warned, they have a double coat that can shed a lot. So regular brushing and a good vacuum will be required. It's also important to clean those skin folds as well each day to keep them dry and nourished to stop any bacteria or infections that could also make them very smelly. Definitely. They're oversized eyes also require extra care and can be prone to several conditions mm -hmm. such as cherry eye, corneal pigmentation, entropion as well as extra eyelashes. If left untreated these can often rapidly result in ulceration and even eye loss. So regular checkups on those eyes seems pretty important. Yeah <laughs> absolutely. Also if there's any discharge or squinting in between checks then they should be seen straight away. They're also prone to skin problems as well as spinal deformities which can cause neurological symptoms. Oh, so that is why it is always really important to fully research and understand a breed so that you can be prepared about what you might need to take care of them later in life. You want to, oh, there we go. And they're very talkative too. Good guard dogs. Yeah, never work with dogs or small children, what they say. All right, you're good. We, we kept Bumblebee. You did. <laughs> oh, you can go Bumblebee. There you go. <laughs> to find out how HIF Pet Insurance can help your pet in times of need, visit hif.com.au. <laughs>Dogs may need a bit of a trim in between their professional groans, but it can be a little bit nerve-wracking to whip out the scissors. So, Dakota, I'm hoping you can give us some tips on how to do it safely. 100%. Scissors are sharp and we're working on live animals that are moving, <laughs> so it can be a little bit nerve-wracking. A lot of your fluffy dogs get the little eye boogers that build up in there. You want to make sure you're wiping them out with a warm, damp cloth at least once a day just okay. to keep that under control. Yes. Um, and then you can get in there and trim the hair out as well. You want to be cleaning their ears out with an ear cleaner on a cotton ball as well, just to prevent wax build-up. Okay. Make sure you're not going into the actual ear canal, just clean the outside area. All right, so we want to do it safely, of course. So how's a good way to avoid injury and what do you recommend in terms of scissors? You want to get your dog used to being touched around their face. A really good way to start, especially with young dogs, is to start with a metal teaspoon. Okay. Rub that around sensitive areas like their eyes and their mouth. It feels the same as scissors. And then just take it really slow, just a one snip at a time. Yes. You want to just encourage your dog to stay still. So reward them when they do. Now we want to make sure these are the DGG scissors. Don't worry, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to leave it to the professional. <laughs> um, but they put the little ball end as well, so it makes it a little bit better. Though you still don't want to be going in like this, do you? Yeah, your, your blunt tip scissors are fantastic. Fantastic. It makes it obviously they're not as sharp at the end if your dog does happen to move. Yes. Number one golden rule, make sure you always know where the tips of your scissors are. Don't just focus on the area you're using to cut. Okay, and also around their mouth it gets a bit grimy. Yours is mm, a bit grimy. <laughs> After they eat, go in there with a the cloth that's the if there's anything left over. Make sure you're nice and careful when you're trimming around their mouth, obviously. You've got to be careful of where their lips are. Tongues are very easy to cut. You've got to keep it mm. shut. <laughs> um, you can hold their chin hair. It's a really fantastic way to keep them still. A lot of dogs are fine with that. Okay. And obviously keep their mouth shut when you're trimming as well. All right, lovely. Then next, let's move on to the paws. They obviously want to be getting them used to that. Yes, 100%. Watching TV, hold them a lot and everything like this. But then there's a lot of hair that grows in between the pads and over the pads, which can be quite dangerous because they can slip, particularly with older dogs. 100%. Yes. So what you want to do, make sure you check in them regularly. Check that there's no little prickles or anything getting in there. Mm -hmm. It's really common to get mats between your toes. So yes. Make sure you're really combing out this area and keeping it trimmed. And you can go in with your blunt tip scissors and just clean up so there's no hair hanging yes. over the paw pads. If your dog is slipping, that can cause injury. So we want to make sure we're on top of that. And then, of course, there is the bottom. Yes, this is an area that gets really gross really quick. Make sure you're washing the area really well when you're washing them and then get someone to help you when you're trimming the area, help you keep the dog upright and the tail out of the way um, and make sure you're really careful about where your tail is when yes. you're trimming around. And yes. You don't actually have to go right down to the skin, just trim any hair that's kind of hanging over to help keep things nice and clean. And holding the scissors nice and flat, I would imagine against that very sensitive yes, part 100%. of their bottom. Just hover you know above I mean? the skin is all you really <laughs> need to do. <laughs> all right, lovely. And any other tips? Make sure it's really quiet when you're doing this. You don't want your dog to get spooked and something random to happen no. that's going to just catch their attention because you want them to stay nice and still. Make sure you're using your blunt tip scissors and always get someone to help you if it's going to help keep your dog still. Lovely. Thank you, Dakota. Thank if you you'd well. like to find the DGG grooming range to help you with your home trims, then you can visit your local pet specialty store as well as pet stock online and in store as well. Thank you again. Thank you. For those of you who follow us on social media, you might be aware that Darcy has had a pretty rough trot over the yeah. past 12 months, particularly in relation to his 
eyes. And you might also notice that it's looking a bit funny. Oh, Darson, he's just not real happy at the moment not either. Happy, he's no. not. So what happened is he ran into a couple of things and I noticed him pouring in his eyes and things weren't quite right. He wasn't catching the treats when I threw them down. So as we say a lot, always take your dog to the vet if you suspect something's wrong, which I did. Yeah, so they were very subtle signs mm. that Lara noticed. And when we actually had a look at his eye, we unfortunately found that he had a detached retina. It's not really a painful condition okay. and a dog's not going to be able to tell you that things look a bit strange. So it can go easily unnoticed. Yes. But the things that can cause it... Number one, I think with him, the suspicion was trauma. So he hit a goal po post. Yes, yeah. he did. And he also loves to shake his dollies like a true ratter does which we used to laugh at. Shaking toys, especially if you're a Jack Russell or a Terrier, is a big no-no. Mm. There's two things that can become detached, which is the retina and also the lens, which is the part of the eye that gets cataracts. The other things that can cause it, which weren't the, a, a worry in Darcy, mm. but are infections, um, high blood pressure, yes. blood getting behind the retina can cause it to peel off, um, inflammation, and in breeds like Shih Tzus, yes. they're genetically predisposed. Okay. So we found it had happened. Yes. And then there was the big deal of well, what are we going to do about it? That's right. And how do we stop the other eye from doing the same thing? That's because right. He only had vision in one eye. He did. So he had retin retinopexy. Yep. Well done. Which yeah. is one thing that you can do to help keep those retinas on. Yep, it's basically where they get a laser that causes small scars and that causes the retina to, to adhere better to the back of the eye. So the reason why we wanted to talk about this was also so people became more aware about uh, detached retinas. But number one, if you have a terrier dog breed, they love shaking toys though. <laughs> so I hate saying it, but don't let them do it. Trust me, as Maybe an tug owner, of war. Yeah, tug of war, okay. That crazy shaking. Crazy no, shaking. no more of that. No. And then also, as soon as you suspect that something is going on, take them to your vet so you can get onto it straight away. Absolutely. To find out how HIF Pet Insurance can help your pet in times of need, visit hif.com.au. While dogs technically don't need carbohydrates in their diet to survive, there is plenty of research to show that adding some fruit and veggies into their diets can be really beneficial, isn't it, Narelle? That's right, Lara. And that's because phytonutrients or phytochemicals, which are found exclusively in plants, have been shown to prevent chronic diseases, not just for humans, but for our dogs as well. And this can help to reduce conditions such as obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular and neurological diseases, and even some forms of cancer. Now, talking cognitive function, they can really help the brain, can't they, Buster? <laughs> Absolutely. And that's because the brain is so vulnerable to oxidative damage. Mm -hmm. So studies have found that feeding senior dogs in particular yes. a diet rich in antioxidants coming from a variety of different fruits and vegetables decreases rates of cognitive decline as they age as well as improving those age related behavioural changes. And there are some great studies but the one I love is about the adding of fruit and veggies into the diet of Scottish Terriers and the reduction in bladder cancer. I love it. Yeah, and this is one of my favourite studies as well because the message is so powerful. Mm. So they found that dogs fed just a standard kibble diet, those that also consumed a variety of cruciferous, green leafy mm -hmm. and yellow orange vegetables yes. at least three times a week in addition to their standard kibble, experienced a reduction in cancer risk of between 69 and 88% compared to dogs consuming just the kibble alone. That is so incredible. However, unlike us humans, it's not about getting as many fruit and veggies into their diet as possible, is it? No. So we need to remember that dogs have species-specific nutritional requirements. And while it might vary a little bit, what that means is we want to see around 70% lean muscle meat mm -hmm. from various sources, 10% organ meat with approximately 5% of that coming from liver, okay. around 10% bone and cartilage, and then around 10% plant matter and other healthy additions in their diet. And of course, not all fruit and veggies are equal either, are they? No, absolutely not. So unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of dog foods incorporating what's referred to as high glycemic index mm. plant matter, potato, corn, peas and grains. So all of those are really high in starchy carbohydrates, yes. which we know is converted into sugar in the body and which we really do want to avoid in our dogs because that can contribute to obesity, skin issues, diabetes and other metabolic disorders. What are some of your top ones that you think that people should be adding in? We want to go for bright colours, so yes. things like broccoli, spinach, carrots, blueberries, 
citrus fruits, capsicum. Yes. And something that a lot of pet parents may not consider are our nutrient-packed herbs, such as parsley. Yes, and they need to be either lightly steamed or pulped as well. Yes. Um, which is why if you want to move away from, you know, a high-processed, high-carb diet, I do recommend moving towards a big dog raw food diet. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they've done all of the hard work for us mm. to produce a nutritionally complete and balanced raw food diet that has all of the right ingredients in the right amounts and no preservatives. No, easy. And they come in a little frozen patty, so it makes your life very easy. So if you want to find out more, check out the Beak Dog website. Thank you, Narelle. Thanks, Laura. Hey, Buster, do you want... Oh, thanks, Buster. Do you want a blueberry? <laughs> Just as it's important for our canine companions to be up to date with their vaccinations and parasite protection, our feline furry friends also need to be protected from diseases and illnesses that can cause pain and suffering. Cat vaccination rates tend to be lower than our canine friends and I suspect one of the causes may be the stress associated with vet visits for both cat and owner. The key to making your cat's trip to the vet a stress-free one is creating a positive association with their cage or carrier. Cats are territorial creatures and feel very vulnerable when out of their usual environment. They can, however, be trained to tolerate or even enjoy social outings and the carry cage. In the same way that you would crate train a dog, place the cage on the floor open and put their food and treats inside and slowly encourage them to spend more and more time in there before slowly shutting it for small amounts of time. Crates that open at the top can also make it a lot easier for us at examination time. Take your cat in the cage for car rides in the car to get them used to it, but without actually going to the vet so that they don't always associate being in the cat cage and the car with a vet visit. My cat Finn comes on holidays with us and for visits to my parents' house, so he is really quite comfortable in the car and doesn't meow much at all. They can suffer from motion sickness, particularly if they're stressed, so just make the trips short and use a calming pheromone spray like Philly Way and don't feed them beforehand, of course. Ring up before you enter to see if there is a space that you can go away and wait for a little while without noisy dogs around. Use treats and lots of praise in a nice, quiet voice to keep them calm. During the exam, stay close to your cat and use treats and lots of praise to try to create a positive association. Try to keep yourself calm and allow plenty of time to get them in there so that they don't pick up on your stress or anxiety. There's also lots of different medications that can be prescribed to reduce general anxiety or just occasional anxiety triggered by a vet visit, for example, or a car ride. Talk to your vet if you suspect your cat is anxious to determine the best course of action. You can also check out the Have We Seen Your Cat Lately website for more tips and tricks for getting your cat to the vet. Many people are aware of the great role that assistance and therapy dogs play within the community. However, there are still some barriers in terms of accessibility, isn't there, Wendy? There is, Lara, and the Australian burden of mental health is significant mm. and rising. So while room-based treatment options exist, the adherence to those therapeutic treatment plans aren't necessarily as good mm. for those that suffer from complex trauma. And that's what brings people to animal-assisted therapies. Yes, and so how are they helping in that environment? By having um, very qualified therapists working alongside animals, it just provides that bridge between yes. the client, the animal is non-judgmental and provides this sort of environment where the client can open up and build a relationship mm. with the clinical therapist and uh, actually adhere to their therapeutic treatment plan. There can still be a little bit of confusion around the different assistance dogs and how they work. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes, well, one of the challenges that we have is helping the general public understand the different types mm. of animal-assisted services. So Jack was trained as an assistance dog and that helps people with uh, various conditions mm -hmm. to better access public life. Yes. Um, then we have allied health professionals working as animal-assisted therapists. We have educators, learning and development professionals facilitating learning outcomes yes. through animal-assisted learning. And then we have those volunteers that may not hold a qualification, but their animal has been assessed as suitable for going in and visiting different settings, like aged care settings or um, hospitals or universities to help 
reduce stress yes. and provide comfort and we know that it'll increase uh, the oxytocin levels yes. and reduce cortisol for people that might be experiencing stress. Yes, like you're doing to me now. now. <laughs> <laughs> so how is your organisation helping, I guess, build the, bridge the gap between awareness and what's going on in the sector? Yes, well, our purpose is to advance the understanding, the acceptance and the accessibility of animal assisted services for those in need. And we also run various professional development and educational seminars yes. to really help people understand the different types of programs that are available. And uh, every February we run National Animals Helping Humans Month. We also raise money to support people in need who may be financially disadvantaged and being able to actually fund, you yeah. know, the relevant services that could help them. And the Petspiration Foundation is supporting your work as well. How are they helping you? Uh, the Petspiration Foundation have been wonderful. They made a significant donation to Animal Therapies Limited and that helped us facilitate a most amazing program throughout February and uh, that it helped also fund people with disabilities to access that information for free and also to help us build our new national directory. Well, that's great. If you'd like to find out more about Animal Therapies Limited, it's animaltherapies.org.au. Yes, it is. <laughs> and if you'd like to find out about the great work of the Petspiration Foundation, visit their website. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, Lara. And thank you, Jack, for the cuddles. I'm feeling very relaxed now, even in the rain. <laughs> As a Pet Stock Rewards member, if you purchase any participating brand of flea, tick and worming treatment, including NextGuard Spectra, they'll give you 15% brand cashback to use the next time you shop for the same brand, even if it's on promotion. T's and C's apply. Visit the website for details. Would you like to win a Pawson prize pack worth over $2,000? One lucky person will win a year's supply of VitaPet treats, Big Dog Pet Foods, NextGuard Spectra Monthly Chews, a $250 Pet Stock gift voucher, DGG Grooming and Apparel and a year subscription to Dog TV. Plus, there's six consolation prizes featuring my latest book, World of Dogs, with a Vita Pet Treat Bundle. To enter, sign up to our e-news and tell us the name of one of the charities featured this series. All entries will receive a free e-book on how to create a happy, healthy dog, so visit poochesatplay.com. That brings us to the end of this week's episode, but there's plenty more information and entertainment on the Pooches at Play website and social media platforms. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.